Hello, welcome back to MCLA and tonight's presentation in our Green Living Seminar Series. I'm Elena Traster in the Environmental Studies Department. This semester is Green Living Seminar is, as many of you know, organized around the theme of environmental pollution. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. Uh, they take place on Thursdays at 5.30 here in the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, room 121. Today's presentation, I think it's going to last about 45 minutes with an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And uh, I'd also like to invite you to come back next week to join us. Uh, next week we'll be hearing from uh, Zofia Bauman, Assistant Research Professor at the University of Connecticut, who will be giving a talk titled Mercury in the Environment, Ecological and Human Impacts. Today's presentation on PFOA in Vermont and New York will be given by David Bond, Associate Director of the Center for the Adma Advancement of Public Action at Bennington College. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for the invitation. And thanks, everyone, here tonight. I'm David Bond. I help direct the Center for the Advancement of Public Action at Bennington College. I also help direct the Understanding PFOA Project, which is an NSF-funded project that tries to open up the analytical resources of the college to a nearby environmental problem. And so we've been involved with PFOA since about 2016, and we have resources to sort of calibrate and orient our science classrooms to take questions the community is asking about PFOA and begin to produce data for the community around those questions. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. I come at this as a social scientist. I'm trained as an anthropologist disclosure at the very beginning, and I'll be wandering into some scientific grounds that I, I am not, uh, was not formally trained in, but I think anthropologists are very good at going into foreign worlds and trying to find their way in them. So science is sort of one of those worlds that I've wandered into, tried to find my way in. Just very quickly, talk over some of my projects. I work on fossil fuels. Before, before uh, PFOA, I was uh, very involved in research. The BP oil spill, Alberta tar sands, refineries in the Caribbean and extractive frontiers in the far north and all the ways that fossil fuels in different ways are causing grave harm to our world and in ways that the sort of existing environmental policy is often very complicit in that destruction and struggles to find a way to actually confront it as the, at the scale of the sort of harm it's causing. Often very good at doing incremental things very bad at sort of facing up to the scale of the problem we now live with. So that's my sort of background. In, in about two, uh, 2015, 2016, as I said, I started to get involved in PFOA. This talk is going to sort of go over uh, three themes around PFOA that I sort of like to talk over and happy to engage in questions. So one is the, sort of the properties of PFOA. And I think there's something particular about the properties of PFOA that don't quite fit the script of a lot of the toxics we've learned to think about previously and sort of regulate previously. And I'm curious about how those properties kind of fit and don't fit within the ways we've sort of built to respond to and regulate toxics in the U.S. I, I, when I give the talk elsewhere, I often say, I start with the fact that you know, the PFOA is maybe the most ubiquitous toxin you've never heard of. It's likely in the carpets here. It's in a lot of your rain jackets. It's in all sorts of things that we have all around us. It's, it's found in penguins and polar bears. It's found in just about every crevice or corner of Earth. Everywhere we've thought to look for this stuff, we found it. Yet, uh, it's a synthetic. It was engineered in the late 40s. It doesn't exist naturally. It was produced in a lab, and it's only been around for about 75 years or so. And, and largely, it's, it was restricted, it's, it's sort of where it was manufactured is largely around plastics and petrochemicals. So it's, it's sort of where it was, was used is fairly confined, and yet where we find it is everywhere. It's universal. The companies very early on knew from the get-go there were real huge health concerns about this. Some of the first tests they did with rodents led to a number of tumors in the rodents. They moved on to monkeys. What happened? The first batch of tests, all the monkeys died. And uh, the head of toxicology at 3M wrote a little memo saying, quote, certainly more toxic than expected. They moved, they kept lowering the doses. The next one, I think half of the monkeys died and kept lowering the doses. And alarms were going off all over the toxicology unit, both 3M and DuPont, which were the major sort of use, manufacturer and user of PFOA and other perforinia compounds were aware early on there were, there were real health concerns about this. They did a worker cohort study. 
They tried to follow the health of their workers who were exposed to this in the factory. Notice really alarming trends around different sorts of cancers. Any worker that was associated or came into contact with this chemical had uh, higher risk uh, and, and uh, rates of certain cancers. What did they do with that? Nothing. Uh, one interesting fact about that, in 1976, they tried to find uh, a community in the U.S. to compare health trends to their workers who were in the factory and being exposed to PFOA. So they went around the U.S. to blood banks to try to get some blood samples to find an unexposed population. 1976. It was, it was first engineered in the late 40s. It had only been around about 20 years, really only used in consumer products for a decade or more. What did they find when they went around the U.S. to blood banks? They couldn't find a, a sample of blood in the U.S. that didn't already have this chemical in it. 1976. What did they do with that information? They hid it as far away as they could in the archive and kept on manufacturing it. So these companies knew from very early on that this was a really alarming chemical, that it was causing a number of health problems. They knew it was almost universal as early as 1976, and yet they hid it away as far as they could in the corporate archive. What I want to say about this, the properties, a couple of the properties that I'll sort of talk over, it doesn't fit the script of toxicology, environmental policy, and remediation. Uh, it doesn't break down. Some of the, the health concerns don't follow exactly the dose-response curve that sort of underlies a lot of toxicology. For some of the, the concerns, as a senior scientist from the EPA told me, there's no exposure level at which there are no effects. It, it doesn't quite fit the script of toxicology, which is the dose-response curve. The dose makes the poison, which, if that's the case, you can set a threshold for. This chemical, for some reason, at a broad level of population, uh, doesn't quite fit that dose response curve, that there are health impacts at any level of exposure. It's everywhere, universal contamination, which poses both very practical legal questions of how we might prosecute this thing, how we might try to begin thinking about remediation, and also philosophical questions of what kind of world we now inhabit, uh, a world of sort of total contamination. Uh, so much uh, of how we think about the world uh, presumes that contamination or toxics are somehow located over there, or they have a density in some ways. And chemicals like this are beginning to suggest that it's sort of the new condition, a new universal condition, which poses sort of philosophical questions, but also practical legal questions of how we might begin to prosecute or remediate a problem like this at that scale. So the first sort of theme is something about the properties that I'm kind of curious about, and the ways that the, com the, the companies that manufactured and profited hugely from these chemicals knew about these alarming properties very early on and did nothing. What I want to say, the, last, the question I pose on that is how we might hold those who've profited uh, from these chemicals accountable while also keeping an eye on everything that doesn't quite fit within our existing scales of justice. What do I mean by that? The properties sort of don't quite fit with an existing regulation. <laughs> So how do we hold the companies that profited accountable while also keeping an eye on the ways that this problem exceeds the rules that we have, the regulations we have? The second sort of theme I'm interested in is what civic roles colleges and universities have. When something like this happens, the public, the impacted community, often has really serious and urgent questions. And this moment we live in where local journalism is often struggling, they often have, the public has, has real questions and they don't quite know where to go. And I think there's a role for science classrooms and campuses to begin to open their doors to nearby environmental problems and sort of think through how we might, you know, rethink science education in, in terms of its civic responsibility towards citizens becoming better uh, participants in their present. So how might we open campuses and classrooms to big, unprecedented, still unfolding problems to both help citizens understand what's going on and also become better agents or actors in that? The, th the third theme that I'll talk through, that's the corporate archive, everything the, the companies knew early on. The other theme that I'll talk through very briefly is, the, is how science and experience often go in different directions. A lot of the science of PFOA has sort of extracted all the facts and figures from the worlds where that knowledge is most needed. It often presents the science in a kind of abstract way, really good, 
but it often isn't attentive to the lived worlds where those problems are, are sort of in, in, you know, being, being lived out every day. At the same time, journalism and many forms of sort of writing about these problems has certain genres that often overplay the dramatic parts uh, and the sort of spectacular parts without attention to the science. So I'm very interested in how we might draw together the best of sort of science and the best of storytelling to try to hold the facts within the worlds where they're most needed. And that's part of the, the, the paper I'm going to give in a moment, is trying to do that, trying to go back between the science and, and the, the worlds in which these problems exist, and trying to find ways of making that science intelligible to the people who live these problems every day. So those are the three sort of big themes. And with that, I'm going to jump into it. Sorry, these are the science and the, these are the questions we get from the community and some of the things we've done. With that, I'll start. And happy to return to any of those themes and the questions. And I'm an anthropologist, so apologies, but we deliver papers. We read them. <laughs> apologies. <laughs> There's different disciplines, have different genres of presentation. PFOA, I'm told, is the slipperiest chemical in existence. Nothing sticks to it. A peculiar quality that found profitable application within the manufacture of plastics. A white waxy powder first engineered in the 1940s, PFOA helped press Teflon into waterproof fabrics, non-stick kitchenware, and in thousands of other consumer products before being washed away without a thought. As shockingly large amounts of this synthetic petrochemical were dumped into the environment, such slipperiness was cast in a disconcerting light. PFOA resists the forces of decay. As designed, PFOA is impervious to the ecological jackhammers of microbes, sunlight, heat, and even time. Heedless of the boundaries we take for granted every day, PFOA also slips through our bodies, national borders, and earthly mediums like water and air with remarkable ease. In addition, PFOA has evaded regulatory scrutiny for decades despite growing evidence of its toxicity. Yet it turns out that PFOA does get tangled up in some things, like organic matter in soils, activated carbon filtration systems, protein receptors in humans, and a growing number of class action lawsuits. In the past few years, a handful of advocates and, and lawyers have worked to pull the properties of PFOA into political legibility. Some 75 years after PFOA first entered the plastics manufacturing industry, it may no longer be possible or feasible to remove PFOA from the environment. Yet these groups nonetheless labor to call the negligence of PFOA's profiteers to account and to minimize the harm going forward. Much of this centers on firming up the science of PFOA, whether by inscribing PFOA with a more exacting molecular identity or standardizing detection methods and exposure thresholds. These scientific methods pull PFOA into something tractable. Yet in doing so, they often lose sight of the bruising confrontations that first brought PFOA into public view and glide over the practical demands of impacted communities. PFOA is becoming factual, yet these facts all too often stand at a very safe distance from the destructive logics and wounded lives that first called them into being. What forms of understanding, I wonder, might assail those logics and assist these lives. Although the engineered properties of PFOA at the center of this inquiry, I take them up neither as metaphor nor reduce them to mere chemistry. It's the dialectical tension between these two orientations, the open-ended nature of the first, and efforts to pull PFOA into something more solid and prosecutable that work to define PFOA contamination today. I've worked on this for the past four years with residents struggling to understand and respond to the discovery of PFOA in our community in Bennington, Hoosick Falls, and Petersburg. And in this work, work, I've often asked myself, how might social research make PFOA stick within the quite reasonable demands of communities impacted by it, while at the same time keeping an eye on all that doesn't yet fit within our present scales of justice? Slippery indeed. Through no great foresight of my own, I stumbled into this project at a dinner party in early December 2015. After toast celebrating the end of term, a colleague led me to a corner before asking, you study disasters, don't you? <laughs> and explained a curious addendum she had found in a recent water bill from the village of Hoosick Falls. Signed by the mayor, the letter noted that the element perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, 
had been detected in the wells supplying the public water system of Hoosick Falls, but assured residents that drink, the drinking water complied with all federal and state guidelines and levels detected were well below any threshold for concern. Do you know anything about this, she asked? A few days later, I found myself in Hoosick Falls with three students, not quite sure of what we were looking for and even more unsure of how we'd know if we found it. A picturesque place, Hoosick Falls is nestled in the wide bend of the Hoosick River, where mountain waters tumble over one last rocky ledge before bending across farmlands gently sloping towards the Hudson. The Hoosick Falls Little League complex marks the spot where the river swings wide and then begins its embracing turn around the town. Just behind left field stands supply well number seven, a tree-like steel tube rising a dozen feet from the ground boxed in chain link fence. With only a low hum indicating its heft, the well is capable of pumping nearly a million gallons of drinking water a day from the aquifer below and serves the roughly 4,500 residents. On that crisp December day, the hum of the well mixed with the dull rumble of the St. Gobain high-performance plastics plant, its roof line rising over the trees some 400 yards away. In a few days, Brendan Lyons of the Albany Times Union will report that St. Gobain employees routinely dumped PFOA in this field and company officials were aware of chemicals from their plant had infil infiltrated the aquifer uh, below, but had neglected to warn the town. Standing by that well on the December day, however, it was hard to tell exactly what was out of place, where exactly the problem was. A few stops later, we pulled into the Topps grocery store, where pallets of bottled water were being unloaded, filling the middle of the frozen aisle with boxes of one gallon drinking jugs of water. As with most months, the three rows of chairs reserved for residents sat empty in the village board meeting that month. Alongside changes to the snow plowing routes and sidewalk improvements, the last 10 minutes were set aside for the water issue. In a month, these meetings would become major media events, packed with television crews, hundreds of angry residents, and huddled teams of city, county, and state officials. Held on the basketball court inside the old armory, these meetings would be devoted entirely to PFOA. But for now, the water issue was one planning issue among a dozen others. The mayor offered a brief update from the state on the need for further testing, but emphasized the need for calm. And the water department gave a tentative report on what filtration systems might be useful if this PFOA thing proved to be a real problem. The numbers were shared, 642 parts per trillion in supply well number seven, but nobody seemed certain of what they meant. That is, nobody except a handful of residents who had begun educating themselves about PFOA. We all know we got a problem. Our aquifer is poisoned. What are you going to do about it, they ask. The village board responded to these challenges with polite recusal, deflecting the urgency of such demands with mild-mannered calls for more research and waiting on advice from New York State. The mayor closed the meeting by noting how very pleased he was with progress on the water situation. It's a very positive situation, he said. PFOA is derived by mixing hydrocarbon feedstocks with hydrogen fluoride and then electrifying it. The charge breaks the hydrogen bond and allows the now freed fluorine atoms to fuse with the now freed carbon atoms. The result is a wholly synthetic perfluorinated compound, different links of carbon fortified in fluorine with a carboxyl tail. It was first engineered almost by accident in a 3M lab in 1947. It had no known uses, the story goes, until a technician spilled some of it on his shoes. That shoe, he soon noticed, never got dirty. PFOA repelled both water and grease. Further experimentation revealed that PFOA doesn't react with any known thing. PFOA introduced a degree of inertness, hitherto unimaginable within chemical engineering, a particularly useful trait in the production of plastics, which in their molten state can be notoriously sticky. PFOA quickly became the premier surfactant in the manufacture of high-performance plastics like Teflon. That is, PFOA helped spread plastics very thinly and very evenly over a number of surfaces. And after application, PFOA was baked off or washed away. As the scale of production amped up and the costs fell, PFOA also came to find common use in many consumer products, like stain-resistant carpets, spray-on fabric guards, ski wax, and in food packaging of all kinds, from Chinese takeout containers to Starbucks pastry bags, from pizza boxes to popcorn bags. Michael Hickey certainly stands out. Tall with soft features, 
Michael is well known for wearing pink Oxford button downs in a town that lives in the faded palette of car hearts and blue jeans. Rarely raising his voice, Michael is nonetheless a force to be reckoned with and came to play a pivotal role in bringing the issue of PFOA to light in Hoosick Falls. At 39 years old, Michael watched far too many of his classmates and friends die of cancer in their 20s and 30s. There just seemed to be a lot of cancer in our community, he told me. When his father passed away from kidney cancer, Michael was devastated. Although his father never smoked or never drank, he worked in the St. Cobain plastics plant right up to his diagnosis. Late one night in the spring of 2014, Michael Googled Teflon and cancer and started reading. He quickly narrowed in on PFOA and started compiling a number of articles, many of which were just published by EPA that year. I started staying up a couple of nights each week, reading for three months, he said. He told me, the articles noted the link between PFOA and cancer and described how the chemical contaminated drinking water near plastics plants. Alarmed by what he was learning, but unsure of its scientific validity, he took his pile of articles and notes to a local doc doctor and asked for advice. The doctor took a look and told Michael he thought he might be onto something. Encouraged, Michael took his findings to the village board and in early 2014 suggested the village test its water for PFOA. I thought it'd be a no-brainer, Michael said. After curt discussion, the board refused to test the water for PFOA. The village had decided on a new marketing campaign to lift itself out of long industrial decline, Hoosick Rising, and testing for obscure petrochemicals in the drinking water was not the kind of press the town wanted. Undeterred, Michael took samples of the tap water from the dollar store at McDonald's and his parents' house, paid out of pocket for a commercial lab to analyze the water. The results indicated PFOA in the drinking water at levels between 400 parts per trillion and 600 parts per trillion. But what did that mean? Measuring toxicity on the scale of one part per trillion, that is an analytic sensitivity equivalent to finding one person on about 125 Earths, pretty, a pretty sophisticated analytic sensitivity, is a very recent achievement. This achievement comes with a laundry list of caveats, but largely rests on the reinvention of a century-old device, mass spectrometry, or the mechanical art of weighing atoms. In the past few decades, liquid mass spectrometry has ushered in a minor revolution in the granularity of environmental science and policy. Mass spectrometry uses what's called targeted compound analysis. That is, the incredibly sharp resolution of the LCMS is relative to the precision of standards used or as an analytic chemist explained to me, with liquid mass spectrometry, I can only see what I'm looking for. The LCMS does not measure the concentration of a chemical in the sample directly, it measures a sample in relation to a standard concentration. Perhaps no chemical has exemplified the promise and predicament of LCMS analysis like PFOA. While worker cohort studies in, in the companies demonstrated clear links between PFOA and a host of adverse health impacts inside plastics factories, the problem of exposure outside the factory was largely invisible until LCMS made parts per trillion visible. It's only with LCMS that we've begun to see PFOA in the environment, one analytic chemist explained to me. With LCMS, as a leading environmental engineer noted, quote, it's only in the last five years, and he said this two years ago, that we've gained the ability to reliably quantify PFOA in water and soil. Why? Quote, PFOA standards of the accuracy required for LCMS have only become commercially available in these years. Why? Until 2003, DuPont and 3M controlled all the labs that could measure and monitor PFOA, in part by claiming that LCMS standards that they had developed were proprietary. So no commercial labs had the standards you needed to test at that scale for these compounds. It took a series of lawsuits to finally make those standards available to commercial labs and academic researchers. Although its role remains largely uncredited, the analytic sensitivity of the LCMS was key to allowing epidemiological and toxicological experiments to begin asking new questions about the health impact of PFOA in communities outside the factories, especially in the form that most people are exposed to it in extremely diluted levels in drinking water. With evidence of PFOA in the tap water, Michael Hickey shared his lab results with the village board. In November 2014, the village conducted its own tests, which found PFOA in fi at 540 parts per trillion in supply well number seven. Calling the results, quote, encouraging, 
the village board erroneously informed the community that PFOA levels were, quote, within and under EPA guidelines. They were wrong. Michael Hickey and others formed a group, Healthy Husic Water, which complained and reached out to New York State DOH for guidance. DOH analyzed the drinking water in the summer of 2015 and by winter was ready to present its findings to the public. Over a year after Michael Hickey first discovered PFOA in the tap water, the village hosted its first public meeting devoted entirely to PFOA. At the front of the room, New York State DOH uh, officials manned a table handing out an information sheet that, that said, uh, can you read that? Health effects are not expected to occur from the normal use of the water. That's the fact sheet that, that New York State gave its residents. At the back of the room, a citizens group had set up their own table. There they handed out the EPA uh, Emerging Contaminant Fact Sheet. Uh, this is the highly technical document that was, that was prepared for water managers around the U.S. that were starting to think about the, the question of PFOA and drinking water. It wasn't written for a public. Yet this was the best resource that residents could find that sort of outlined the health concerns around PFOA. So New York State's in the front of the room with this. Residents are in the back of the room with this. In between, the mayor told everyone within earshot that the drinking water was a, quote, personal choice. And while he understood why some people were choosing not to drink the water, he would continue to drink it. Michael Hickey eventually called the EPA. In late December 2015, the EPA sent a letter to every resident of Hoosick Falls warning them to, quote, not drink the water from the Hoosick Falls public water supply or use it for cooking, end quote. It took two years after, after they first discovered PFOA in the drinking water to come to any kind of decision of what that meant. Two years. And, and the town, in some ways, once it found, it did everything it was supposed to do. It went to the, the state health department and sort of asked for help and guidance. And it took two years to actually come to a conclusion of what that actually meant. PFOA doesn't seem to react with any known thing. For most of the past century, this profound inertness of PFOA was taken as evidence of its benign nature. Toxicity was widely understood to be in accordance with the bioreactivity of a chemical. That is, the more reactive a chemical was, the more toxic it might be. In 1997, a 3M-sponsored article noted that fluorinated organics like PFOA are, quote, generally viewed as recalcient because of their lack of chemical reactivity, end quote. Today, the inertness of PFOA is coming into new focus, not as evidence of its harmlessness, but as an intricate vehicle for a new regime of harm. Until PFOA, toxicology often presu presumed that most absorbed organic contaminants would be stored in... As a leading organic chemist studying PFOA explained to me, quote, they don't partition to fat. That was our traditional model for organic contaminants. Instead, PFOA interferes with proteins. This low-frequency distortion of protein functions is at the frontier of unfolding research into PFOA. Most striking, this toxicity is evident at extraordinarily low levels of exposure like parts per trillion in drinking water. When I first met Emily, she had a hand-painted sign that proclaimed Cloud 9 staked outside her driveway. A few weeks later, the sign leaned up against a shed. A few months later, it was replaced with a for sale sign. It's no longer my house, Emily said. It's theirs. She pointed at Taconic Plastics, just down the road from her in Petersburg. Once they poisoned my water, they took away my home, she told me. Emily worked three jobs, until she could pull her children out of a decrepit two-room trailer and into her dream house. As she described it, quote, a three-bedroom, 2.8 acres, American dream. Did it before I was 30 and did it while I was single. I loved it. In 2016, Emily was informed that PFOA had been detected in her well at levels over 30 times the federal health guidance levels for short-term exposure. She was devastated. State officials asked her to wait patiently while they worked something out with the company. She didn't, and as she tried to bring attention to the issue, friends rebuffed her. The former town supervisor cornered her in the, in the town. Quote, do you really want to cost 200 people their jobs over this, he asked her. She prevailed, and against tremendous headwinds, forced the issue into light of day. Much to the embarrassment of company leaders and, and state agencies who'd been sitting on the problem for decades without telling anyone. In Petersburg, New York State DEC knew about the alarming levels of PFOA in the aquifer as early as, I think, 2004, 2005, when Taconic Plastics disclosed its DEC, and the state didn't do anything. 
So the Petersburg case is a little different than Husik insofar as the company disclosed the fact of contamination of the aquifer early on, and no one did anything. So this is a story uh, that she's often recounted for television crews and in legislative hearings in the past two years, and when I arrived with my students to sample her well, she'd always recount it to us. One morning, she flashed a grin after telling her story. She said she had a surprise to share. I'm pregnant, she told me. As I offered my hesitant congratulations, she interrupted me, looking to my students. Does anyone need any breast milk? Because I don't. My blood levels are too high. I'm not going to pass these chemicals on to my baby. None of us knew what to say. For many residents, the shape of PFOA contamination gathered into felt form around the two remaining social safety nets in rural America, family and home. In these working class communities, family and home are often talked about more in terms of reciprocity than gain. Folks pour their labor into their families and homes with some hope they will eventually return the favor with care, meaning, and stability in regions otherwise bereft. PFOA smuggled profound harm into the two vestiges of well-being left in these downwardly mobile communities. And that's where long-tolerated risks snapped into fury over PFOA. Michael Hickey's later reflected, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer or even environmentalist, but I knew something wasn't right. I started as a heartbroken son and quickly turned into a scared father. Residents organized as mothers and fathers. They protested as homeowners. At public meetings, residents explained the impact in terms of the children now carrying a lifetime of medical uncertainty and their meager life savings wiped out in collapsing real estate prices. These two ledgers of loss form the basis of how residents drew long-standing exposures into present tense demands for justice. Comprised of a synthetic carbon fluorine bond, described to me as the Hercules of chemical bonds, or molecular rebar, PFOA is nearly indestructible. Unlike other persistent organic uh, pollutants, PF, uh, as one, uh, one environmental engineer explained, quote, there is no known natural degradation or decomposition process for PFOA. Whether exposed to high or low temperatures, the radiating energy of the sun, the appetites of microbes or fungi, PFOA does not break down. Chemically, stable on the order of centuries, a lifespan I was told that is not based on empirical data, but on the fact that most existing models for contaminant breakdown can't figure timescales beyond a century. We don't have evidence of it breaking down, and we don't know how to model it beyond a century. So its breakdown is marked at a century. PFOA is, as one regulator put it to me, quote, redefining the concept of environmental persistence, end quote. Another quote, this stuff exists on geological timescales. Environmental advocates have taken to calling PFOA a forever chemical. No future for white men, writes political theorist Wendy Brown. It's not an unpopular sentiment, especially among progressive intellectuals. At a distinguished talk last year, one prominent theorist summarized a talk on the Anthropocene. Quote, white men are the problem both as individuals and as a subject position. They need to be eradicated from the planet if we have any hope for survival, end quote. At a conference, I was explaining how faint exposure to PFOA inflicts subtle injuries on the male reproductive system. Smiling, a colleague interjected, quote, maybe that's a good thing, especially in rural America. There's too much white masculinity out there anywhere. The room filled with laughter. The house sat at the end of a long, unmarked dirt driveway. When I drove up, he was standing alone, working the tractor. I walked over and introduced myself, but he cut me off, asked me to leave. That's my wife's business, he said. I handed him a card with my phone number and got back in the car and left. His wife called a few hours later. Quote, our son died of testicular cancer. I know we can't prove PFOA did it, but it made me so mad when New York State said there was no testicular cancer in our community. Our son died of testicular cancer. He had just turned 21. Health concerns first brought PFOA to light in Hoosick Falls and soon became the major field of uncertainty in the community. PFOA exposures are strongly connected to immune disorders and a host of cancers. For reasons that are still dimly understood, PFOA also seems to hijack the male reproductive system and is linked to collapsing sperm counts and spiking rates of testicular and prostate cancer. In response to the health concerns of the community, 
in May 2017, New York State DOH released a, quote, cancer incident investigation report. The report determined, quote, that there are no statistically significant elevations in cancer were found of any of the cancers associated with PFOA exposure, including zero cases of testicular cancer. Announcing the results, DOH told residents that their worries about the health impact of PFOA were not supported by data. Residents were furious, and rightly so. Many knew firsthand young men in the community stricken with testicular cancer. With the help of several public health professionals, I helped organize a community health questionnaire to bring the knowledge the community had of its own health to public light. We'd often meet in a local diner before going door to door on brisk fall weekends that turned turn snowy. We'd start downtown, modest homes clustered along the river and around the factories, paint peeling on every side of the home but the one facing the street, before following the roads up into the hills, through the cookie cutter suburban developments and farmhouses sagging under the years. It was a simple questionnaire, asking if anyone in each household had been diagnosed with the six illnesses most persuasively linked to PFOA exposure. After a few months, we amassed a sizable data set one that suggested far more cancer cases than the state had admitted. Before releasing the results, a local doc doctor and I would contact every positive indication of testicular cancer to verbally confirm the details of the diagnosis. When he finally called me back, I was driving down the highway. Blinkers on, I pulled over to take the call. Can you tell me about your diagnosis, I ask? Quote, I felt a lump on my testicle on January 18th. I remember the date because it was my 24th birthday. I went to see my doctor a week later, and about a month after that, I was scheduled for surgery. They were only supposed to remove one testicle, but they told me if they found any evidence that the cancer had spread, they might have to remove the other one. When I came out of surgery, I learned they removed both. I was 24. He was trying to finish college at the time, and now he works three jobs and has a GoFundMe campaign to pay off his medical debt. Some 75 years after it was first synthesized, PFOA is found nearly everywhere we've thought to look for it, in shallow soils, in deep aquifers, in oceans and ocean creatures, in rain and snow, in penguins and polar bears, and in every major population of humans on Earth. With PFOA, as one toxicologist told me, quote, we all have body burdens now. Despite the planetary reach of contamination, the experience of PFOA toxicity remains largely tied to communities adjacent to plastic manufacturing hubs in the U.S. and Europe. Whether as Lighthouse or Harbinger, these Rust Belt communities now bear the brunt of the injuries of PFOA. While advances in spectrometry have detected PFOA in water, soil, and bodies worldwide, the lived impact of PFOA gathers in that much maligned demographic, the white working class. In falling sperm counts, hormonal imbalances, and testicular cancer, PFOA further erodes the crumbling edifice of breadwinner masculinity, inflicting harms that seem to echo popular progressive critiques of the irredeemable body of rural America today. Toxic masculinity by other means. And what's the difference, really? When I gave an early version of this paper at a distinguished colloquium, such disciplined disregard to these worlds surfaced with ease. In a time of resurgent racist violence and renewed colonialism, why should social science care about a case like this? And isn't this just an example of where the founding violence of settler colonialism necessarily leads? Although never stated expressly, the implication was clear. Aren't these people just getting their due? PFOA has forced the realization, as one EPA scientist explained to me, that, quote, even if a contaminant doesn't react with anything, it can have toxic effects. Despite its inertness, it is now clear that PFOA is both highly mobile in the environment and bioaccumulates in plants and animals and humans. This mix, combined with its sheer durability, have started undermining basic assumptions in environmental engineering, water contaminants, and toxicology. As one leading environmental engineer put it to me, PFOA is a paradigm breaker. PFOA, as one expert witness in an ongoing case explained to me, quote, is going to be the next generational challenge. This stuff is a whole other can of worms. In animals, the bioaccumulation of PFOA exhibits profound species variation. Every animal has, absorbs it differently. In humans, PFOA has a half-life of three to five years for reasons that are not completely understood. One EPA toxicologist told me, quote, three to five years is an eternity for a chemical to stay in the body. There's also growing suspicion that PFOA does not follow the dose-response hypothesis. 
the more you get, the sicker you get. That underlies contemporary toxicology. Instead of a clear dose response curve, several studies of PFOA have demonstrated a statistical scattershot of adverse health impacts after a population is exposed to PFOA, often at barely detectable levels. The leading EPA toxicologist working on PFOA told me, quote, there is no threshold under which there are no effects. There is only low effects. In this, PFOA is not only overwhelming the dominant paradigm of toxicology, it's also breaking the backbone of toxic regulations, thresholds. Facing an angry high school auditorium in Hoosick Falls in 2016, asking him why PFOA was not classified as a hazardous waste, a senior EPA official responded, quote, you and I know it is, but it hasn't gotten that classification yet. The law hasn't caught up to the science, end quote. In more unguarded moments, a few leading scientists and officials working on the issue has off have offered a slightly different sentiment. Rather than law catching up with the science, they spoke of how the materiality of the problem hovers at the edge of what is reliably known. With a humble awareness of just how much remains out of view. Quote, there are plumes we're just figuring out how to see, one top EPA scientist told me, but there are so many plumes we don't yet know how to see. Another leading environmental engineer told me, quote, with PFOA, we don't know if our actual exposure is increasing or not. What is happening is our knowledge of exposure is increasing. It was sometimes hard, he said, to tell the difference. Throughout 2016, PFOA is detected in a handful of public drinking water systems and thousands of residential wells across upstate New York and southern Vermont. At each new plastics plant, the strategy was the same. Set up a perimeter at some distance from the plant and begin to test every residential well within that perimeter. And again and again, we were told that the perimeter was, was well in excess of anything that would be suspected. After enlarging the perimeter time and time again, state officials in Vermont and New York eventually reached the same conclusion. There's no workable perimeter. As one state official told me, quote, the shit is everywhere. From the farmland surrounding the plants to isolated valleys in the Adirondacks and Green Mountains, just about everywhere they sampled for PFOA, they found it. About a year ago, the strategy changed. Instead of setting up, setting up a perimeter, the state would establish a, quote, natural background level for PFOA. There was just too much of this synthetic petrochemical to discern an outer edge. The annual conference for environmental science hosted its first panel on PFOA in 2016. The year before, an organizer told me, they tried to put the panel together, but there was no interest. One year later, it was standing room only. Several hundred environmental consultants, municipal and state officials, and a handful of industry reps packed the room, with folks standing in the back and squatting in the aisle after the seats filled up. PFOA, the organizer said, leaning over, is blowing up. Michael, a senior chemist at a commercial lab, began his presentation on analytic techniques with PFOA. Quote, it's a huge growth area for us, he said. And with all of his lawsuits in the works, the market was exploding. Quote, you can make a fortune on this stuff. His, his second slide was a mismatch of newspaper clippings about communities impacted by PFOA in Parkersburg, West Virginia, Hoosick Falls, New York, and Bennington, Vermont. Obligatory headlines of why we care, he said, to light laughter. Looking back, PFOA was always there. Those summer evenings when a light blue fog drifted across the golf course and members of the country club quickly moved indoors to finish their meals, crisp winter mornings when farmers woke to find their fields painted in bluish hue. There were the recurrent migraines and bloody noses among those living in the new development on the ridge just above the plant. Some days I couldn't even go outside, more than one resident told me. Workers called it the Teflon flu, an onset of aches and pains after inhaling too deeply while loading the mixers or forgetting to change clothes after getting it on you. Sometimes, of course, you just came down with it for no good reason, other than you worked at the plant. An electrician told me he dreaded getting work at the plant. The pay was great, he said, but something stuck with you when you left, something you couldn't shake for days. A parent told me how the company used to donate industrial barrels for apple bobbing at the community's annual Halloween party. The faint markings, P-F-O-A, still visible on the barrels. A mother spoke of the nightmares that racked her sleep on nights when she could smell the plant emissions. The ceiling was alive and it was dripping down, dissolving everything. I could smell it. In the summer, many residents told me, you had to remember to close your windows in the evenings. That's when they fired the stacks. The nights, I heard again and again, smelled of burning plastic. Thank you.
So sorry if that went a little bit long. But <laughs> Are there questions? Okay, so I'm assuming that the Safe Drinking Water Act covers drinking water, obviously, but like uh, in terms of PFOA, like, is there anything being done? There's a guidance level. <laughs> so the, the EPA has classified PFOA and PFOS as an emerging contaminant, which is the process by which they begin to, to sort of formally regulate it, but it's not yet listed as a hazardous substance that can be sort of, you know, with teeth in the regulations. So the EPA issues health guidance levels, which states are then uh, can take uh, and, and sort of turn into more enf enforceable standards. So a number of states have done this. You know, the, the EPA recently said it, when this first started, it was 400 parts per trillion was the EPA guidance level for short-term exposure, short-term being, I think, a few weeks for drinking water. Since then, the EPA has lowered it to 70 parts per trillion in drinking water. Vermont is at 20. New Jersey went down to 8 parts per trillion. These are really tiny numbers, but everyone sort of is drifting in that direction. There was a recent report on um, the ATSRD put out that recommended uh, that it might, it might go to below even eight for some, for some cancers. So the, the more research is happening, the more it's sort of driving down. But at the federal level, there's not yet teeth in those guidance levels. They're advisories. Uh, it's not, um, I guess, enforceable. So if I remember correctly, the Safe Drinking Water Act covers like, uh, MCLs. Like if yes. there's specific chemicals listed under as a, um, like under category, it's supposed to be regulated by the government. Is that still true? If it's a listed contaminant, yes. Uh, perfluorinated compounds are known to be a, a huge problem. I mean, the the map I had of the environmental working group is this there. These are all the health, uh, the water districts where it's been detected. In 2000, when was this? The EPA at some point asked every public water system it served over 10,000 people to, to sample their drinking water for perfluorinated compounds. They got the results back. They found this. What did EPA do with that? It put it in a database and, and, and sort of ignored it. The environmental working group, sort of advocacy group, went through that database and realized this is really alarming uh, and pulled that data together to begin to create this map and then tried to reach out proactively to contact folks in these communities and say, hey, this chemical has been detected in your water. And the Environmental Working Group has a great map, interactive map, where you can look at to see where, where you know, water just, it's been detected. But it's not yet something that the federal government is in, enforcing. It offers advisory levels, guidance on, but not enforcements. If that makes sense. So the uh, post review that some of us read um, mentioned that some of the industries were doing sort of a voluntary phase out. Yes. Uh, do you know what the status of that is? How many companies are participating? And Related, Voluntary. <laughs> and relatedly, um, do you know anything about the alternatives and, and potential toxicity? Yeah. Two separate questions. And yeah, so the phase out. 2005, the phase out started. And it started not because EPA was doing a great job, it was because EPA was doing a terrible job. Uh, in part, 3M decided their liability was just too great on this thing, <laughs> that they needed to sort of find a way of getting rid of it. So that the industry itself, I mean, had never disclosed to EPA, which it was man it's supposed to do that they, it had evidence of the health concerns around these chemicals. It decided it was going to phase out its, uh, itself for fluorinated compounds, PFOS namely, but also PFOA. DuPont was the biggest purchaser of PFOA for its Teflon uh, products. So what did DuPont do? We'll open our own plant in, in Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina, to manufacture PFOA. This is all, I think, 2003-ish. So 3M announces it's going to phase this thing out. It's going to phase something out that's bringing in about a billion dollars annually in revenue. It doesn't make much financial sense. And they're saying, no, it's fine. The chemical's fine. We've just decided we want to phase it out. They phase it out. DuPont steps up, picks it up. Rob Bellot, who hopefully some of us know, there's a great profile of Rob Bellot in the New York Times Magazine, who started a lawsuit against DuPont around some of these questions. He was the one that first discovered the corporate archive that opened up in discovery all of the things the companies already knew about these things but never disclosed. Once Rob Bellot opened that up, he sent that all to the EPA. Uh, that's the thing that the, the companies then began to say, oh, maybe we should have a voluntary phase out of this. And what they did was they sort of preempted the EPA 
from actually taking a more, a more sort of forceful stand on it. So they all agreed to a voluntary phase out, which was sort of totally uh, out of many major manufacturing streams in the US by 2015. They did that. I saw a graph at a conference recently that while the manufacture and use of PFOA, PFOS, went down considerably in the US, worldwide production of these chemicals rose a little bit. What happened? Many of these companies moved their plants to India and China and just kept producing. So worldwide, these chemicals are still, still being produced at the same quantities that they were before, just not in the US. The alternatives, this is the other big question. Our regulatory structure on toxics is about prosecuting individual chemicals by individual chemicals. Europe has a different model. They regulate chemicals by families, by comp, you know, families of compounds together. It's presumed that perfluorinated compounds share similar toxicological profiles. In Europe, they're being regulated all together. In the US, we, we regulate individual compounds by individual compounds. So what's happening? We're starting a process that often takes over a decade to begin to formally regulate PFOA, PFOS, possibly PFNA, a handful of these. What have the companies done that use these? They've started tinkering with the recipe and finding something that's very, very similar to that, but slightly different. Gen X is the one that is getting a lot of attention that a lot of companies have sort of turned to. Some of these compounds are presumed to break down in the manufacturing process to PFOA or PFOS, but they technically are just outside the regulatory structure we have in the US, which is often described as a kind of whack-a-mole regulatory structure. You know, We go to regulate one chemical and it just something else pops up over here. We regulate that, something else pops over here. Uh, our, our sort of way of going about regulating toxics is, is grossly out of date and, and wholly inadequate for the challenges we, we need to face up to today. Once it's in the water, can it be gone now? This activated carbon filtration system is very good at, at removing PFOA from drinking water. So yes, there are sort of filtration systems that are good at removing it. Husik Falls has a several million dollar unit right now that filters all of its public drinking water. So it, there, are, there are ways to filter it out. That said, there is some evidence, not a lot, but some questions that the shorter chains, which is what some of the companies are turning to to use, the shorter chains, you know, PFOA is C8, it's eight uh, carbon molecule. The shorter ones may slip through the carbon filtration system. Uh, now that's not something that, that's, it, it's a question that people are starting to think through. Uh, and there have been some uh, studies that show the shorter chains do pass through the carbon filtration system easier. But PFOA is easily removed with the right filtration system. But some of the compounds that companies are now moving to might not be filtered as, as easily. So you said that it can't be broken down by anything in nature, right? Yes. But can it be uh, like broken down chemically in a lab, potentially? There, yes, there, there, are, there are some ways that folks have figured out how to break it down. One, by using uh, really, really strong oxidizers, but that's probably something that's outside of my field of expertise. There, are, there is something that's local that's kind of interesting, though, is that uh, incineration. So there's some folks who've, who've said we might want to incinerate this. So Department of Defense, which has a massive amount of this stuff on hand, in part because it was used in firefighting foams, AFFF firefighting foams, uh, DOD uh, just contracted with four incinerators in the U.S. Three are uh, in the south. One is in our region, in Cohoes, New York, uh, and started shipping massive amounts of firefighting foams uh, that are full of these perfluorinated compounds to be incinerated. There's, there's little evidence that it, that kind of incineration fully breaks these compounds down, and yet these incinerators have started to burn these things with little evidence of whether it's actually an effective way of breaking it down or just a way of relocating it to poorer neighborhoods. And so the one in Cohoes has public housing units around it and is a low-income neighborhood. So Department of Defense is shipping its AFFF firefighting foams from military bases across the U.S. to Cohoes to be incinerated in a place that we're not even sure if incineration is an effective way of, of sort of breaking it down. Yeah, David, building on that, how do, uh, how do the PFOAs get downwind? It's, it's a great question. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. When we first started, there was a kind of presumption from the state uh, and a lot of the science that we looked at that, be, that the molecule was somewhat heavy 
and it would fall back to the ground right in the immediate uh, per perimeter of the factory and that you wouldn't find it that far from the factory. So it would come out the stacks, fall back to ground, go into the aquifer and sort of contaminate groundwater from the factory out. Uh, that was the working presumption for about two years uh, in both Vermont and New York. Uh, we started having some questions about that uh, in 2018. Uh, and we looked where we were at and we said, well, if that's the case, we won't find any in the Green Mountains. Have you been to Bennington? Directly downwind of Bennington is the Green Mountains, which were set aside in the 30s, so before PFOA was synthesized. So we looked downwind and we said, if that's the case, we won't find anything in the Green Mountains. So we went and tested the soil and surface waters in the Green Mountains and found what we consider really high levels. Um, we started looking, we, we, we wrote an op-ed about this, and we found elevated levels of PFOA uh, at a scale of about 250 square miles downwind. And you could see the elevated levels in the soil, and then after, after, after that 250 square miles, them fall back to lower levels. Uh, so we now suspect uh, that the emissions traveled far further than anyone uh, was previously thinking. Uh, something that's been confirmed in studies in West Virginia, in Ireland, and ongoing studies in the U.S. That these, for whatever reason, these compounds seem to travel much further than previously thought in their emissions. And the fact that we found it in the middle of the Adirondacks, in, in, in valleys far away from anything, suggests it traveled at some distance to get there. And we did some soil, te soil tests up there. I'm, I'm curious about your philosophy for how you set a regulation level, concentration of PFOA in drinking water, soil, vegetables, whatever, when the detection limit is really hard and when the damage is maybe at any level, or the, the, the harmful effects. So what, social science, what, how do you approach that? <laughs> it's, the, I mean, it's, the, it's the conundrum of, of, this, of this moment in this issue. It's, it, we're, being asked, we're being asked to do something that's sort of technically impossible. The stuff is everywhere. And now we're being asked how much is safe. And you know, we're, we're, we're forced to ask that question after it's already been distributed everywhere. And in so many ways, it seems to me an impossible question, and yet one that so many communities, often extremely ill-equipped in terms of finances, in terms of scientific sort of resources, is being asked to sort out. And I don't know. <laughs> other than it is the kind of question that so many of our, commu our communities in our region are trying to really think through and, f and figure out their way through. And there, there seems to be no good answer. There's no, there's no going back, right? There's no, there's, no, there's no saying that purity should be the basis uh, of our environmental science and policy. We should somehow try to, tr try to purify ourselves. Of everything. It's too late for that. At the same time, I'm unwilling to accept total contamination as the basis of the contemporary. I mean, this is the very thing that a lot of the petrochemical uh, and oil companies are now sort of advocating. Well, everything's contaminated. So who's to say who's really responsible for this? Let's just start with the fact of total contamination and now try to figure out how to move forward. I'm unwilling to go there, too, because I think they need to be held accountable. Now, what you do in that space between not pure and not fully accepting total contamination, I don't have a good answer. But that is the space that I think we're in. Thank you.